That one is so soothing, isn't it? Uh, good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name's Jeff. I'm one of the pastors. Um, and Kimmy kind of told you we're concluding uh, our series on the Holy Spirit. Um, and I said this at our worship night a few days ago, but I, like just personally, uh, the way that we as a church have just been pursuing the Holy Spirit together has been really meaningful. Um, my, I was an adult convert, and, and like my first tangible relationship with God was the Holy Spirit. Um, and so it's just been really impactful to see the different ways that the Holy Spirit's been showing up in people's lives. Um, and that's just super awesome. This morning, one of the things we're talking about is probably one of the more obvious things people think about when you're thinking about relationship with the Holy Spirit, and that's spiritual gift. Um, and so we're gonna, uh, this is not gonna be exhaustive, uh, but we're gonna take a look mostly, if you wanna be in your Bible, mostly 1 Corinthians 12 uh, is what we're gonna be looking at. But I wanted to just share with you something that I kinda did in preparation uh, in the event that it's useful to you. There were two books uh, in particular about the Holy Spirit that just are really, really dialed in and good. And so I just wanna let you know what those are. These are not the only books. Uh, but Gordon Fee's Paul, the Spirit, and the People of God, uh, highly recommend. And the second one was Sam Storm's Practicing the Power. Um, it, they just, I think they do a great job of taking a topic that for some of us feels kind of weird and a little bit out there uh, and making it accessible. Um, I also, before we get into this, just wanted to kind of address uh, something that probably won't affect most of you, but it doesn't hurt to know it. A um, couple of big theological words. Uh, one is cessationist, and one is continuist. And so here's what those things mean. Um, there is no Bible scholar that reads this book and doesn't think supernatural stuff happened in this book. Like, I mean, Jesus came back from the dead, so. Um, but, but the way we see spiritual gifts displayed in the early church as recorded in Scripture, nobody disagrees that that happened or didn't happen, there are those who their theology tells them uh, that, and these are the cessationists, that those miraculous things have ceased, meaning they no longer happen. Um, then you have a continuous, which is someone who believes, I, I, don't, I don't see in scripture where it tells me those things are over, and so my theology tells me that those things are still active today. Um, I will tell you personally, as a church and as a denomination, we are continuous. We believe that these things continue to happen. We think that Scripture teaches it, and, and I don't know anybody on staff or in leadership that hasn't had some personal experience. Uh, but when you think about, or at least when I would think about a church that's heavy into Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts, there's a certain culture to that kind of church that doesn't really match necessarily the culture of this church. And so I just wanna call that out ahead of time. Um, and so if some of these things I say feel weird or uncomfortable, like I, get with me, I'd love to sit down and talk about it a little bit more. Um, but we're just gonna dive right in and I'm pretty much gonna just walk through the first part uh, of Corinthians 12, but I, I just need to let you know the way that uh, Corinthians was written, it was written as a letter to a specific church, addressing some issues that that church was facing. And so just good to know that context. And really what we would call chapters 11 through 14, address the worship gathering that was happening at the church at Corinth. So like this gathering right here, uh, that's what this is gonna be talking about. Uh, so we'll just start uh, chapter 12, verse one. He starts by saying, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so, what you kind of have to know the context to understand is the idea of supernatural things happening to the people who were worshiping in Corinth was not unusual. It wasn't unusual in the way that it feels unusual to most of us. It was a pretty regular thing. What Paul is actually trying to help them to understand here is what is of God and what isn't, right? And we're not super concerned with the isn't. We just want to make sure we stay 
with what is concerned of God. Um, now, I have, uh, there's a term that ministers sometimes use around setting up communion. We call it fencing the table, right? It's, it's identifying what are the markers that Scripture clearly teaches that are set up around this thing for us to know. And I think it's really important with spiritual gifts for reasons I will get to that we set the fence up a little bit. You know, when we, um, so I have five kids, two dogs, uh, and when we bought our house, there was no fence in the backyard. We had like some woods. I could never just like let my kids go out and play, right? The, the dog, like even when they were puppies, if they were gonna be outside, I had to have them on a leash just to make sure that they didn't take off and go somewhere they weren't supposed to go. And so we did what most people do. We put up a fence. Right? And the purpose of the fence was not to restrict what the dog was going to do. It was so that we could take the dog off the leash, right? That we could just send the kid outside without micromanaging them and allow them to really just lean in to what's happening. And so most of what I'm going to kind of walk through here is me trying to set up a boundary line or a fence for us so that inside of it, we can feel free to eagerly desire the gifts. And so the first one really is what I already said, and that is the context, right? The context of spiritual gifts is gonna be the gathering of believers. Now, that might be, I've, I've experienced that gathering with believers in my office, or in people's homes, or at a lake. Like, it's not always a, a worship setting, but it's, it's in community with other people. Um, then he goes on in verse 4 to say, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Um, and I'm, I'm going to pause on that sentence. Uh, because there's two really important things that we just need to point out. For one, when he says manifestation of the Spirit, he's talking about spiritual gifts. And I love that language for understanding what a spiritual gift really is. Um, I don't know a whole lot of folks who, who believe the gifts are still happening uh, that think it's not God's power, right? Like, anything that happens in a spiritual gift. It's, it's not like a superpower in the Christian. It's God's power. But what we will often do to try and describe it is say that, that I am given access to the Holy Spirit's power for God's work. And I'm not saying that that is wrong, but I think a much better way to view it is that I give the Holy Spirit access to me to do what he is going to do. Because a lot of the responsibility, especially on the front end, is in me opening myself up to God, not necessarily me defining exactly how it's going to be used, because he'll do that for me. Um, the second thing I'll draw your attention to is just that it says that it is for the common good. There is not going to be a situation where spiritual gifts show up from God, and it's not for the common good. And so it's just helpful to know that. He goes on in verse 8. He says, To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Um, and, and now most people, when they look at this passage, kind of get focused on a list of gifts, but I don't want us to miss that at the, the end there, it says that he distributes them just as he determines. And that's an important corrective for me, right? It's helpful for me to be reminded that my judgment on the spiritual gift that you have really hadn't have anything to do with this book. 
and it's not something that God is particularly concerned about. Look, I, there, are, uh, there are certain gifts that I think I, I, ha- like I exhibit in life. Um, if I could pick, I, I would like to be able to lead worship. Like I just, that's the thing, that if I'm choosing, I'm choosing that. Um, and I keep asking, and it has not happened yet. So uh, just know that it's also important that we not do the things that humans kind of tend to do, where like I look at a gift in your life, and then I try and build some recipe or formula that allows me to somehow control things I shouldn't control or know things that aren't my business. And so that's just helpful. Um, now, I do recognize the importance of what the actual gifts are. So I made a slide, so we can pull that up, that the, these are, if you want to grab a picture of this or if you're worshiping online, you can hit a screenshot. Um, you, I don't have time to go into all of these, but I, I will say, um, for one, I'm sorry, ushers, I was supposed to call you guys to pass the jeans pocket, and I just remembered. So you can go ahead and do that. Um, I will say that in the body of Lake Forest, I, I know that there are people exhibiting all of these gifts, right? There are people who exhibit the gift of healing in our body. There are people who I, I have been prayed over multiple times in tongues, people in our body. Those things that are not as readily obvious because of our culture, they're biblical and they're active here. Uh, what is not on this list but is in other places in Scripture, are things like the gift of hospitality and the gift of administration and things that are, we have this tendency to downplay them. Like in particular, I usually, I talk about the gift of hospitality. That's a supernatural gift. And and as the guy who technically sits on the front porch of this church and greets new people, I can tell you the number one thing that people report back that they experienced was the welcoming, hospitable, loving environment that this place is. And and that may not feel supernatural to you, but I have seen people who have been absolutely broken by church, loved back to life in this place. That's an important, that is every bit as important as a gift of healing. And so we need to call that out. Now, I will, I have a a spiritual gifts assessment that I really like. There's a ton of them. You don't have to use mine, but I've got one that I really like, and it's the kind of thing you fill it out. It gives you a little key to kind of understand it, and I will say, if you take it and you want to get together with me or any of the other people I know in our community that have the ability to walk through those things, like that's an open invite to all of you. Um, We're going to send that assessment out so everyone who gets our e-note you will get that assessment in your email. If you want to take it, do something with it, please do. I will also let you know that I realized probably Thursday that I, I, we really need to have a, probably like one of those one-off, two-hour on a Thursday night class things where we walk through these different gifts because it's important. We just don't have time to do it here. Uh, so hopefully the date for that will also be in that email. So if you don't get our e-note and you want any of the stuff I just said, uh, make sure you either let me know or let someone know, and we'll be sure to get that information to you. But for now, I'm going to move on from there, um, except to just point out the variety of gift, right? The, the widespread differences that exist between these gifts, because it's just super important to know. And, and if we had time to read, I think it's 26 through 30, but like this next little section, This is where Paul uses an analogy most of us have heard before, and that is looking at the church as a body. One body, many parts. And what he's really trying to identify is that, like, you have what you have because Holy Spirit determines. But what you have is not less important than anything else. It's also not more important than anything else. And what he's really trying to get us to understand is the necessity of unity right? That that everything God does is about unity in his body, and the gifts are not different. So there is a a diversity, there's an interdependence that we have as a body based on the fact that we have all of these different gifts. Um, And he, he kind of concludes chapter 12 in verse 31 by saying, literally just telling people now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Um, And I'm going to pause there 
for a minute. There's another piece, but I'm going to pause there uh, for two reasons. One, when it says greater gifts, like didn't I just say none are great? What that means is the needs of the body define the importance of the gift. So in one body, a particular gift would have a certain importance because of the needs of that group of people. And in other body, it would be different. And so that's, there is no hierarchy that we can point to. It's, it's very much about the relationship that exists between God and his bride in that local context. And, and the second part I just want to pause on is where it says, eagerly desire these gifts. And, and this is, for me, where having a bit of offense is really helpful for me, right? Understanding kind of clearly what the boundaries are because I, I know that I am very, very good at taking credit for things God actually did. And I want to make sure that in my eagerness for these gifts, I don't start getting it wrong or, or even worse, start thinking that it's actually my strength and not his power. Um, but there's an importance to that word eager, right? That's a different kind of desire uh, to be eager. And I, so this, this is the best example I could really think of to give you. Um, my 13-year-old and 9-year-old, Noah and Judah, really, really dig this artist, Boy With Uke, who's like a YouTube music guy. And he, I mean, he's not, he's not bad. Um, I can't speak for his language. But he's, he's pretty good musically. Um, and this past Thursday, he had a new album. And when his new albums drop, the way they do it is they, go, they get li- put set live on YouTube. And so you can go to YouTube, and all of a sudden you can see all of these videos and listen to the thing. And so we had a whole conversation. Like, that's midnight, and it's a school night, but can we do like a thing, and at least the four oldest people in my family, uh, we all stay up, or some of us might have had to get up again, and go and be there to enjoy the thing together. And we said yes, and we did that. And you best believe that my boys, at like 1150, They were sitting on the couch, the TV was on, YouTube was up, and they were ready for the moment that we showed up and we could all enjoy that thing. And that's how we are meant to eagerly desire the gifts, right? They did not, my kids did not force me to get out of bed and watch it. They didn't force Boy With You to release a new album by the things that they did. The control wasn't theirs, but they were gonna make sure there was nothing that stood in between them and what they desired. And that's the posture that we're meant to have towards the gifts. Um, But the second part of that there says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And this is the, the final kind of fence post. And honestly, I think one of the most important ones. Uh, So verse 13, starting in verse, chapter 13, starting in verse one, Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And he needs us to understand that with a demonstration of the gifts, there is always love. Always. And and chapter 13 here is the thing that most of us have heard read uh, at weddings or on coffee mugs or anniversary cards, the love is patient, love is kind, like that thing. That's what's being described here. And he's trying to get us to see that if that's not present, this ain't God that's going on here. And so I thought it would be helpful. You, you can grab it if you want to. You don't have to. But to take all of the fence posts that we talked about and just put them in a singular statement. Um, so what I'm about to say is not Scripture, but I took it right from there. Um, and so this is kind of the statement that I came up with. Spiritual gifts always manifest for the common good while promoting unity through interdependence and always with love. And so if I just remember that spiritual gifts always manifest for the common good while promoting unity through interdependence and always with love, I can feel pretty safe to eagerly desire 
these gifts, to do everything in my power to make sure there is no obstacle from God showing up in that way. Um, And he even, Paul goes on, and this really is kind of the thesis of everything I'm saying to you. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. And really, when you put next to each other the way of love, which I'll do in a minute, and and all the things he says, so long as I'm following the way of love and I eagerly desire the gifts, I'm in the spot I need to be. Um, And so, again, just because it's, it's more helpful for language, I made a slide that you can just screen capture or take a picture of that kind of details the way of love. Right? And so, again, this is 1 Corinthians 13 language. It just, in some cases, I use like an affirmative instead of a negative. But the way of love as described by Paul here is patient and kind. It is content, modest, and humble. It is other-centered, temperate, and forgiving, never rejoicing in evil, but only in truth. It is protective, trusting, hopeful, and persevering. And so really, if that is my measuring stick, right, that is the rubric that I'm holding up to, whatever it is that happening, that's happening, if it's not of God, it will not meet that. Right? That's the thing that gives me safety to lean all the way in, to try and experience these gifts that God has. Um, and, and what I want to do with just the little bit of remaining time um, is explain to you in what I'm hoping is a really accessible, practical way, um, kind of how I eagerly desire gifts um, and what that looks like. And then we're going to wrap that up and move on to the the actual reason that we are gathered today, uh, which is not the stuff I'm saying. This is a precursor to what we're going to be doing. Um, But here's the example that I want to give you. Um, And we can put the slide up so anyone who wants to capture it can. Uh, But this is how you eagerly desire the gift. Uh, There are four things. And because I am who I am, they all start with P. Uh, presence, posture, permission, and purpose. Uh, But let me explain it this way. Anybody in here ever go boogie boarding? Eh? Okay. Um, So there's a couple things that you learn over the years about boogie boarding. For one, if you're not in the ocean, you can't do it, right? Like I need to be in the presence of the water. And even within the water, over time, you start to learn how to spot the places that the waves are going to come up. And so you can go and and you can be present in those places, and then you wait, right? You wait for the wave to come and take you, but while you're waiting, you put yourself in the right posture. So you got the board the way that it needs to be, get your feet ready to kick, and, and you have postured yourself to be exactly how you're going to need to be when the wave takes you, right? Then the wave comes, you got to give it permission to take you, right? You have to let it. What a lot of people do, and I used to do a lot, was mistakenly try and kick super hard like I'm somehow going to add to the power of the wave. And all that does is stop me from getting carried by the wave, right? This, this wonderful feeling of uh, a power that is not mine and is completely carrying me, I lose that if I don't just give it permission to to take me. And then the last thing, uh, which I'm calling purpose, but like that not a lot of people know, I didn't know until I was like 22 or 23, but once the wave has taken you, you can just ride it to shore, but you can also learn how to ever so slightly push down on the tip of your board And if you do it right, it captures the power of the wave, and you get a much better ride. Now, what's dangerous about that is that if I push down too hard, I will lose it entirely because it will no longer be about the power of the wave, but about my strength. And so this is the way 
that spiritual gifts have always manifested themselves in my life. Um, the example that I'll give you that happens probably most often uh, in this context these days, uh, the, the presence, the place is, is usually my office on my couch across the room from one of y'all. And, and I'm going to start saying this stuff, and there's, I guarantee you there's several of you in this room that have heard me say what I'm about to say, but fully engaged in what's happening, uh, inviting God into the process, and just present and open, right, in the right posture for him to show up. And we'll be doing some kind of counseling, and someone will be telling me something and a thought that, that isn't like, it doesn't sound like James Earl Jones or Morgan Freeman, but like that's not mine, right, will pop into my head or an impression that I really, I can't really draw those lines logically. Like I can't say that I necessarily see how this thing is what I should be saying right now. But, and so I'll say to people, I'll say, you'll learn about me. I am a, it pops in my head, it falls, falls out my mouth kind of guy. Sometimes that's God. If this doesn't resonate with you, please just ignore what I'm gonna say. Um, but then I, I lean in. Right, like I push down just a little bit on the tip of that board rather than ignoring it or needing it to carry me entirely. And I say what it is I'm gonna say. And I'm telling you, like I have sat there and I've seen people's faces like, how do you know that? That's a spiritual gift, right? That's a, a demonstration of how those things work. And every Every follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit, which we've been really intentional to say throughout this entire series, right? Just because the Spirit can do more obvious things or less obvious things, if you put your faith in Jesus, he's in there, right? But there are also going to be gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to manifest through you if you will give him access, right? If you, through eagerly desiring, will give him access to work in your life, he will. This is why when people go on mission trips, they come back on fire, because for a lot of them, it's the first time that they can tangibly tell God actually used them. And he will use all of us if we let him. And so, so what we 